is eight o'clock. This is the UK Tonight. There's increased security at Champions League games tonight, including Arsenal's match at the Emirates. This is after threats from Islamic State. Photos of stadiums, including the Gunners' home ground, have been published by a pro-IS media outlet. Ministers in France and Spain say there are enhanced security measures in place for the games on the continent. And the Met Police says there's a robust policing plan in place in North London tonight. Coming up, we'll go live to the Emirates, where Arsenal against Bayern Munich is just getting underway. And we'll speak to a security expert who worked on London 2012 and the 2014 World Cup. Also tonight, a man is arrested over the murder of a mother pushing a pram in Bradford. Kulsuma Akta was attacked in broad daylight on Saturday afternoon and died in hospital. Suspect Habiba Masum was found 150 miles away in Buckinghamshire earlier today. Alan Bates, the sub-postmaster who inspired an ITV drama, gives evidence at the official inquiry into the Horizon IT scandal. We'll find out why he believes the post office is a dead duck. And Bake Off judge Dane Prue-Leith tells me why it's time for an honest conversation about assisted dying, saying she wants the right to die when she decides it is time, and the law should reflect that. All of that to come, and much more, on The UK Tonight. Well, we start tonight with the heightened security at Champions League games, including Arsenal's match with Bayern Munich tonight. This is after threats from Islamic State. A pro-IS media channel published images of stadiums that are hosting matches in Europe's top football competition, including Arsenal's home ground, the Emirates. Well, a statement released by UEFA this afternoon said UEFA is aware of alleged terrorist threats made towards this week's Champions League matches and is closely liaising with the authorities at the respective venues. All matches are planned to go ahead as scheduled with appropriate security arrangements in place. Deputy Assistant Commissioner Adi Adela Khan from the Metropolitan Police said this... I want to reassure the public that we have a robust policing plan in place for tonight's match and we continue to work closely alongside the club's security team to ensure that the match passes peacefully. As ever, we ask the public to remain vigilant and if they see anything that doesn't look or feel right, then report it to police or to security staff. Well, the Emirates Stadium may be nearly 20 years old now, but it was built with security in mind, including features designed to deter terror threats. I'm joined now by security expert Lee Doddridge, who has worked on security and counter-terrorism at a number of major sporting events, including the London Olympics and the 2014 FIFA World Cup. Lee, thank you for joining us on the UK tonight to discuss this. Um, first of all... What did you make of these threats being made? Because it's been a long time since we've had a security alert like this where a threat has been made publicly or advance warning has been given. Yes, you're quite right. It has been some time now since we've um, had this sort of um, direct threat made. And interestingly, with Islamic State, it's not the sort of thing that they would normally do. They don't normally um, make specific threats against specific targets. Um, as we saw just recently with the Crocus Hall attack in Moscow, there was intelligence to suggest that they were possibly planning an attack, um, but obviously no direct um, correlation to the actual venue itself that we're aware of at the moment. So it, it's quite a um, an unusual um, step to have you know three venues um, identified as part of the attack. But I think we also have to weigh that up sensibly with the the response that we're seeing from the police and from the security forces here within the UK. I mean, if there was a, um, a certain level of intelligence that really did identify these as targets, and potentially this evening we'd be seeing the games played behind closed doors with no spectators or even postponed for safety reasons. Can you talk to me about the kind of security measures that are in place? Any fan that will go to a Premier League match, a Champions League match in the UK will know that security checks are in place, bag checks, ticket checks, there's patrols, there's stewards, there's all sorts of security measures in place. Does anything tonight change in that respect? When we talk about heightened security or this kind of threat, what changes, if anything? Um, I think it's important to understand that there's um, layered security, as we'd call it, so various um, aspects to the security and not just physical within the stadium itself, 
um, but procedures, and you mentioned quite rightly, there will be what they call conditions of entry. Um, and these are normally publicised in advance and especially on the tickets um, to say what can and can't be allowed into the the, uh, the venue, which won't be any different from any uh, regular match that spectators would go to, whether they're season ticket holders or just going for the first time. Um, what we'll also see, um, obviously, is potentially increase maybe stewards and staff and, and obviously supporting um, policing patrols as well. Everything from uniformed officers to maybe... Um, community policing officers all the way up through the tactical firearms teams on standby. But what we have with a number of venues, uh, the Emirates Stadium being just a classic example, is that there are pre-planned um, operations in place for any major event there. Obviously, they have live TV footage you know, on, on a weekly basis, so they're used to um, big events at the stadium. But when the stadium was um, designed way back in 2000, in fact, built in 2006, a lot of the security was already built in as part of what we call the, the Royal Institute of British Architects plan of work. So the security and the counter-terrorism measures were already built in to the design and obviously all the policing and extra um, security in and around that would just enhance the overall security. When you talk about the design of the Emirates over 20 years ago now, um, Boy, has that gone quickly. Talk to me about the design of the stadium. Everything from the Arsenal sign, which if anyone has been to the Emirates will know, it's a massive concrete Arsenal sign outside the stadium that a lot of people pose in front of for pictures. But it's not just a photo op. It has a practical use. Perhaps you can talk to me about how stadiums are designed in this way to, to protect against threats like this. Yeah, and uh, apologies, obviously, we'll touch on the, as you mentioned, the Arsenal um, letters itself. Obviously, we won't go into detail of, of other areas because obviously we need to keep certain security measures as they are. But um, you think even 20 years ago, we're always planning ahead and looking at potential threats that maybe we haven't seen in the UK. We've seen them around the world and we have to, and as your image is showing there, the, the letters now Arsenal. They've actually specifically been designed. Each letter will stop a seven and a half ton vehicle at 50 miles an hour. Normally you see um, large barriers or blockers as we call them. But in this instance, they decided to actually make the wording Arsenal one of the security measures. Um, so obviously it fits within the, the theme and the overall look and feel of the stadium. But the whole idea with that is to keep vehicles away from the stadium, especially the larger vehicles of so a vehicle born in provide, um, devices. Um, but as you quite rightly said, it's now become an iconic feature of the site. Fans will have their photographs taken on it. And as we've seen, even down to the, the London, London Bridge attacks, when we have vehicles as a weapon used to actually um, come off the road and crash into pedestrians, if all the spectators when arriving are behind that sign, then we know they're safe from that form of attack. Uh, Lee Dodridge, really interesting to get your expertise uh, on this developing story. Lee Dodridge there, security expert. Uh, let's go now live to the Emirates. Our sports correspondent Rob Harris is there for us tonight in North London. And Rob, fascinating uh, talking to Lee Dodridge about how modern stadiums are designed to safeguard against these kind of threats. What have fans noticed there tonight that's different security-wise? Well, there's nothing... Well, there's nothing substantially different, I would say, at this game. There's what the police and Arsenal are calling a robust policing operation in place. But there are, for instance, no armed security here. You have seen them say outside Wembley in the past at the time of really heightened uh, security concerns. Very unusual this is a Champions League game because there are only Arsenal fans here. There's no visiting fans from Germany because Bayern Munich fans are banned over a separate issue relating to fireworks at matches. But certainly... The uh, purported IS threat is something that is on the lips of Arsenal fans we've been speaking to arriving here, although they seem pretty much assured by those messages from the police. Uh, what's something that's quite notable is that UEFA, the Champions League organiser, referenced in a statement today those threats from IS uh, in a statement. They wouldn't often normally do so, but that seemed to be, obviously, since we heard from particularly the French authorities today, talking about how they had put in place sort of stronger measures in response to the, to the online chatter, and certainly as well in Spain, where there are two quarter-final matches this week, including Manchester City playing at Real Madrid. They have activated more stringent measures, certainly in place, in response to, the, to this claim. And we have seen over the years how security has been beefed up at football stadiums in particular in response to sort of wider geopolitical uh, concerns and the growing terror threat, particularly after the Stade de France in 2015 had, 
had those terror attacks as part of the widespread attacks uh, on the French capital that night. And it is Paris where tomorrow night uh, Paris Saint-Germain will be playing Barcelona. So this is quite a notable week in terms of the European football season with the quarterfinals getting underway in the Champions League. But the message from UEFA has been that these matches can go ahead, but they do remain in constant contact with all the authorities across Europe. OK, Rob, thank you. Our sports correspondent Rob Harris outside the Emirates for us tonight. We'll continue to follow the story here on Sky News. Thank you. Now, a man has been arrested today on suspicion of murder. This is after a mum was stabbed to death in Bradford on Saturday afternoon. 27-year-old Kulsuma Akta was killed in broad daylight as she pushed her baby in a pram. Habiba Masoom, who is 25, was arrested 150 miles away in Buckinghamshire this morning. Our crime correspondent Martin Brunt has this report. This was the scene minutes after the fatal stabbing of the young mum. In the pushchair, her baby unharmed and unaware of the tragedy, and safe in the care of police and its mother's friends. At the scene, the local MP met a shopkeeper who'd tried to save the victim, Kulsuma actor. There's a problem across society when it comes to violence against women. It's not just a West Yorkshire issue. We know from, I mean, let's not, we're not going to try and get party political about this because ultimately a woman has lost a life while she was pushing a baby, you know, in a pram, in broad daylight. And that, that ultimately we need services, we need more resources. But there is an issue, isn't there? There's a culture of it's OK to kill a woman, hit a woman. That is not OK. Police say Kulsuma Akta was killed at 20 past three on Saturday afternoon in Westgate, Bradford City Centre. 25-year-old Habiba Masoom was spotted on CCTV in the area at the time. More footage captured him getting on a bus in Market Street ten minutes after the murder. The last sighting of Masoom, he was off the bus and walking along Leeds Old Road. Masoom was arrested in the Aylesbury area in the early hours of Tuesday morning. Police forces across the country have been on alert for the suspect. He was arrested nearly 200 miles from here. Detectives were planning to drive him back to Bradford for questioning on suspicion of murder. The investigation is far from over. Police searched a travel agency in Burnley, Lancashire, near the suspect's home. His connection with the business isn't known, but last year he wrote a review of it. As a social media influencer, he had recently posted a trip to Spain. The murder has left a community in shock and a young child with an uncertain future. Martin Brunt, Sky News, Bradford. The Conservative MP who admitted giving colleagues phone numbers to a suspected scammer has resigned from the party. William Ragg has relinquished the Tory whip and has also stepped down as chair of the Commons Public Accounts Committee. Uh, let's get more now. Our political correspondent Gurpreet Narwan is standing by in Westminster. What more can you tell us, Gurpreet? Yeah, so William Ragg, he was a, is a uh, senior uh, MP, was a senior uh, Conservative MP who admitted uh, his involvement last week in a honey trap sexting scandal in which he handed over the personal phone numbers of a number of his colleagues to a person he had met on the gay dating app Grindr. In explaining why he did that, he said it was because the individual had compromising pictures of him that he had sent over. It's believed that uh, Mr Ragg was uh, involved in a spear phishing attack. And he subsequently uh, decided to step down from a number of parliamentary committees, as you said, and from his role as vice chairman of uh, the 1922 uh, Committee of Backbench Conservative MPs. But crucially, he kept the whip. It was said at the time that that decision was made because he too was deemed a victim of what had happened. But many Conservative MPs were privately questioning that decision while he certainly had the sympathy of some others were less kind, including Andrea Jenkins, who was caught up in this. Uh, she brandished him an idiot for compromising MPs' security. Now, William Ragg has voluntarily decided to relinquish uh, the whip, but uh, cons uh, one Conservative Party source told Sky News that this was just indicative of how weak Rishi Sunak was, that William Ragg had to, in his words, fire him 
itself. Uh, now, we put that to Richard Holden, the uh, Conservative Party chairman who was on this programme earlier. Uh, let's have a listen to what he had to say. He's already uh, issued a, a fulsome apology. He's resigned from the 1922 committee executive. He's resigned from his uh, role as chair of PACAC, which is a, an important committee in Parliament. And uh, he's also uh, given up uh, the Conservative whip. And I think we already knew he wouldn't be standing at the next election. He's already announced his standing down. Uh, so, yes, I think that that's the right thing to have done. Now, a police, a police investigation is already underway, but uh, the Common Standards Committee could open its own investigation into this after that, so it's not going to be the last of it, for sure. Uh, and it's also opened up kind of this broader conversation about uh, security in Westminster, with Sir Lindsay Hoyle, uh, the Common Speaker, issuing new guidance to MPs on how to stay safe on their phones. He's also urging anyone uh, with any information to come forward. Gurpri, thank you. Alan Bates, the former sub-postmaster, whose story was dramatised in the ITV series about the Horizon IT scandal, has told the official inquiry that post office bosses were out to get him because he stood up to them. Hundreds of sub-postmasters, like Mr Bates, were prosecuted for theft and false accounting, while many more were ostracised and forced to leave their communities. Today, he described the post office as an atrocious organisation that is beyond saving. Our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, has more. Hello. <laughs> how much have you been looking forward to this, oh, this day? It's Ooh, taken a while in coming, hasn't it? But we well, get there in the end. Alan Bates has been fighting the post office for more than 20 years. I swear by a mighty God. The, the battle that took him from village halls to a starring role in a TV drama and now to a public inquiry that wouldn't be happening without him. And nothing but the truth. The key issue has always been to expose the truth um, uh, uh, right from the outset um, because the other things sort of always felt f they followed on. If you, once you know the truth about issues, the rest will hopefully follow on afterwards. Um, I mean, <laughs> I didn't set out uh, to spend 20 years doing this. Ready to tell our story. In ITV's Mr Bates versus the post office, he was portrayed as stubborn, forensic and indefatigable. We're fighting a war against an enemy owned by the British. All true in person, of a man who exposed hundreds of wrongful convictions and repeated attempts to cover up the failures of the Horizon computer system. He now says his own compensation is being held up. Yeah. I'm trying to fight for everyone's uh, financial redress in this. But I've also got to fight for my own as well. And I have no doubt that um, it, there's a bit of vindictiveness coming in from the department and post office on this. And the reason I say that is, is quite simple. They don't think there's any worth to any of the work that I've done over the years. Uh, they're an atrocious organisation. They need disbanding, it needs removing, it needs building up again from the ground floor. No, I can't believe it. So... Among those sacked on the lie that they and not the computer were at fault was Anna. She lost her Oxford post office and £80,000 repaying non-existent losses and legal fees chasing compensation. At last, people can't ignore us, yes. Yes, we all feel that, you know. Uh, we cannot believe, we've lived through this. We've, I, I just cannot believe how we've gone through this in the last 20 years. The man responsible for righting the wrongs promised finally to heed Mr Bates's words. It was very, very compelling, the evidence that he provided today. Very sobering for, the, for those of us in the post office uh, as we stand. And we want to make sure that the culture of today's post office learns the lessons from the past. That's very, very much what I want to do. Alan Bates has set out the case against the post office and the officials who over 20 years oversaw a system that devastated thousands of lives. Over the next three months, it will be the turn of those executives and politicians to come here to answer for their actions. I know. <laughs> Whatever happens next, the real-life star of this scandal leaves with his sense of humour intact. What will you do when it's over? Me? I'm going to buy a little post office somewhere and put my feet up. <laughs> Paul Kelso, Sky News at the Post Office Inquiry. Uh, well, earlier I spoke to Lee Castleton, one of the hundreds of former sub-postmasters wrongly convicted because of the Horizon IT system, and I asked him about Alan Bates. 
you know, in all of this process, as everyone's doing interviews and everyone's giving personal stories, people forget Alan's a victim. Mm. You know, Alan is one of the victims. He was treated as harshly and terribly by this company as any one of us. And um, people forget that. People think about all the hard work and all the, you know, sort of stoic, forward-thinking graft, you know, sheer hard graft that he does. But in actual fact, he's a victim too. And um, he was treated awfully and terribly and they tried to discredit all of us but particularly alan you know and um, people forget that he uh yeah he leads from the front he um he's just you know um one of these people that is very 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 focused it was brought up in the inquiry today as part of the evidence that he hasn't received any financial redress yet. And there was a bit of laughter in the room about that because, as you said, people forget that he is a victim as well. He's very much uh, the face yeah. of your campaign for justice. And the new CEO of the post office was in that room today listening to Alan Bates give evidence. And he's been saying that the post office isn't moving quickly enough when it comes to financial redress. But the big question that hasn't been answered yet is why is it being so slow? Are we any closer to finding out? No, I don't think anybody really wants to find out, not at that side, not at the helm. They, we know from previous years, from previous things, that if they waived their one, they could do this instantly. They could make this all happen very quickly, and they're not exactly renowned for good PR. You know, um, out of all the people that's made a claim against the post office, maybe Alan should have been dealt with... I don't know. I, I was going to say it differently, but Alan would not be happy with that because well, you said not today the there's no special place for him in the queue he's one of many and he's very much like that and as probably all of us are and we all um we're all fighting this together so i understand that but out of all the pr things you could maybe have done as a company you know trying to save this fantastic brand that we have in this country maybe um post office should have made a better effort you know but they should make a better effort with everybody and they could they just choose not to they've always chosen not to and they've you know, in my eyes, despicable in the way that they treated all of our victims, all of us. Alan Bates was asked during his evidence today how confident he is that there will be any criminal prosecutions as a result of this scandal, as a result of this inquiry. He said, I think we'll see some, whether it's undertaken by the authorities themselves or whether we as a group have to bring some if the authorities fail us once again. We'll have to wait and see. Do you think that is your next fight or do you have confidence that there will be criminal prosecutions without you having to, to seek that out as a group? Well, I was at Finney Compton yesterday um, and I met a lot of our original people that were there 15 years ago. Mm. They are not any different to they were 15 years ago. And if it takes ourselves to take you know, action against individuals, I have no doubt. Absolutely, not a shadow of a doubt that our group are not frightened of doing whatever we have to do. And if other people cannot manage to do the right thing, let's make it happen. Let's let's make this happen. I'm sure that the public would help us in any way to, to find whatever justice looks like. And I'm looking forward to that as part of this journey. Uh, the former Post Office CEO, Paula Venels, will be giving evidence next month. It's the first time she'll have spoken uh, to the inquiry. And since this... The scandal took on a new life because of the ITV TV drama. What will you want to hear from her, Lee? Truth. Honesty. Who knew what, when, who told her what she was told, why she made decisions she made. All of those things that she's chosen not to speak about. And I think that's shameful. Out of all of the, 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 the process that we've been through, secrets have been damning. You know, um, people that don't speak openly tend to have to not speak openly for a reason. And um, let's hear it. I, I hope that she's open. I really do. I don't think she will be. But I really beyond all hope, hope that she is. Former sub postmaster Lee Castleton talking to me earlier on today. So to come here on the UK tonight, we'll have more on the floods that have forced the evacuation of residents and holidaymakers in West Sussex with more warnings in place across the country. Plus how the people of our target towns are tackling the housing crisis in the absence of any help from the government. And why the world of show ponies is getting on its high horse about hobby horses.
don't write songs to be famous. I write songs because I've got to make something good out of something bad. I liked this film. I think there's been a lot of inf misinformation about it online. A lot of people thought it was going to be disrespectful to her and kind of dwell on the drugs. But actually, it's a, quite a positive, lovely first-person story. In a way, it's told from her point of view. The director wanted to show things from her perspective when, when she met Blake, when she fell for this man who would be very difficult for her. They had a terrible, tumes, tum, you know, tumultuous relationship, as we know. Need to know yes. um, but here, played by right. Marisa Abella and Jack O'Connell, um, there's a rather touching story about romantic obsession and then an obsession which then, of course, led to the writing of one of the best-selling albums of all time, mm -hmm. Back to Black. There's one thing, like, learning the mannerisms and learning of what it is that she does with her body, but there's another thing like inhabiting those to the point where it feels completely natural. So like if someone says something that I don't like, like I move in a certain way that she would move. And if I'm super excited about something, then I'm excited in the way that she would express that, you know, because there's one thing about being present in a moment as an actor, and then there's another about being present in the moment as an actor and also layering things on top. So it was just doing enough work in the preparation process that I wasn't thinking about these things on set that I could just, you know, be with the other people and enjoy it. I think at first, obviously, it takes some adjustment because nobody can be Amy Winehouse. Obviously, she does a very good job singing, but nobody can sing exactly like Amy Winehouse. But she approximates it well enough. And after a while, I think because of the strong filmmaking, you relax into it and, and you kind of believe it. And I, I yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Hello, welcome back. You're watching The UK Tonight. Now, more than 200 people have been evacuated because of flooding in West Sussex. They include around 180 people rescued from a holiday park. And there is widespread damage in Littlehampton after the River Arran burst its banks. Sky Shaman Freeman Powell has this report. This is what was left after Storm Pyrrhic battered West Sussex. And the River Arran burst its banks. The seaside town of Littlehampton is often at risk of flooding, but nothing like this. The rescue operation began around midnight. One person showing signs of hypothermia was taken to hospital as fire and rescue teams moved in to move residents on. More than 200 people were evacuated, most of them forced to flee from Medbury Holiday Park. Among them, Paul Maskell. He spent three hours stranded on his decking, drifting further and further away from his holiday chalet. She was on the bed, um, nearly on the bed, and I see the bed lift and the bed started floating. And then I know it was time to get out. And the sofa was floating and everything was floating, everything was just floating around. 13 miles up the road, others assess what's left of their home. Heavy rain, strong winds and high tides plunge Littlehampton underwater. Residents were told to move to higher ground, but at this bungalow estate, that wasn't possible. <laughs> Many people here say they simply weren't alerted as to how severe the flooding would be. We were given warning, but it, it was, to me it wasn't emphasised enough that it was going to be of this magnitude. All of a sudden, there was like a deluge. The deluge came over and it was like this and it just came through our, our doors and it was a frightening experience to see this kind of height in your, in your front living room. Parts of the Wirral were buffeted by flood water as fast winds met high tides. Forecasters warn that even more heavy rain and strong winds are on the way. Shaman Freeman Powell, Sky News in West Sussex. Coming up on the UK tonight, my conversation with Dame Prue Leith about her campaign to make assisted dying legal in the UK and her desire to die with dignity.
Dame Pruleith has told the UK tonight that the laws on assisted dying must change and she wants the right to die when she wants to die. The Bake Off presenter has joined Dame Esther Ranson in campaigning on this issue, having watched her older brother die a painful death due to cancer. And in an open letter Dame Prue sent to party leaders in Westminster, she detailed that uh, the changes she wants and uh, she has received more than 235,000 signatures. Here is some of that letter. Dame Prue Leith writes, the public should surely have a safe and legal option to end their suffering in a peaceful and dignified manner. For every day that passes until we reform our law, 17 people will suffer as they die. She goes on, I ask you, as you prepare for the next general election, to listen to the voices of those most affected by this issue, dying people and their families. Please bring forward this important debate in the next parliament as a matter of urgency. Well, earlier on, I spoke to Dame Prue and I asked her about her brother David and why his death motivated her to take on the politicians. In the last three weeks of his life, he was spending, I suppose, one hour in every four in absolute agony because they would give him more morphine, but either not enough or not frequently enough because he'd be OK for a couple of hours. In fact, he'd be, you know, on a sort of morphine high, being really nice and, and friendly and, and saying to the doctors that he felt fine. But then the drug would run out and he would be in absolute screaming agony. I mean, for his family to be round while he was crying, begging to die, begging to be um, given more morphine, it was desperate to watch. And then, of course, finally, you know, every four hours regularly, they'd give him a dose. But nobody seemed to be looking at the whole thing from his point of view. It was all to do with the doctor's rounds, and we only do drugs every four hours. And, and, we, and anyway, one consultant said to me, anyway, you do realise, don't you, that morphine is addictive? And I said, you, you've told me he's going to die within three weeks. Uh, I, you know, if he's got three weeks to live, I don't care if he's as high as a kite. Unbearable and difficult for him and your whole family. What kind of life did yeah, David and lead and how would he have wanted it to end? Not like that. Well, of course, like... Oh, no, not like that. I mean, most um, people, I think, have a dream. If they think about death at all, which, of course, we don't do enough, mm. um, they think they have a vision that they'd be like to be in their own bed at home, surrounded by their family, very comfortable, no pain. And we've got a sort of vision that comes from the movies, I think, which, if, you know, the, the patient is lying in bed, somebody's holding their hand, Mozart's playing. It's, it doesn't happen like that. It hardly ever happens like that. But it can. I mean, my brother, my, my son and I went and made a um, TV documentary on the subject, going around America, looking at places which do have assisted dying. And we found many people who described their parents' death or their husband's death or some loved one's death, which had been pretty well like that, at home, w with family, with uh, drugs while the drugs worked. And when the drugs no longer could work mm -hmm. and the patient really wanted to die, they would take a lethal dose or be given a lethal dose by a doctor. And they would just drift off, mm. just as I'd like to. I mean, I, you know, I'm 84, so I think about this quite often. <laughs> and I really think if the... My, my younger brother had a really good death. My elder brother had the one we've described. And honestly, I want to die like my younger brother died at home. Pre, your experience... Free of pain. Your experience of your brother David dying... That is what made you an advocate uh, for those who are terminally ill mm, to, to, to campaign for assisted dying. The rest of your family witnessed the pain and suffering that your brother went through at the end, including your son, who you mentioned there, Danny. Uh, who, for those watching who don't know, he's a Conservative MP, Danny Kruger. Yeah, he saw exactly yeah. what you did, that experience of his uncle. But he believes the opposite. He doesn't believe that 
assisted dying law should come in. Why is that? Why did you both go through the same thing as a family, yet he is opposed to this, you are not? Well, I think there are two, probably, two good reasons. One is that he, um, Daniel is very Christian, and I think that he, his stance is entirely um, intellectual and moral, and it's based on what he thinks is right. Mm. And uh, by the way, our experiences were very different because he didn't have much, he didn't see a lot of his mm. uncle dying. Um, he didn't live near us. I expect he visited him once, perhaps. Um, I think if you can divide the people who <laughs> are passionate supporters of assisted dying and people who are not by, by their experience of it, I think that the the, the antis, the people who are against the idea of changing the law, are generally very principled and either very religious or very um, intellectual about it. They think something is wrong and, and, and should not happen. They also Whereas think it could think be open to abuse, are, don't they? In terms of where do you draw the um, line? Yes, yes, yes. Da Daniel, a lot of Daniel's um, argument is about the, the worry of... Um, of not having proper safeguards, mm. of people being, you know, uh, bullied into dying, you know, by greedy families who want to inherit their money, or maybe more sinisterly by a system, you know, the idea that um, the NHS, who, which is desperate for the beds that have been cluttered up at the moment by old people um, who have nowhere else to go will sort of suggest to them that they ought to choose an assisted death. I think that that's nonsense. You recently penned an open letter to political party leaders and in it mm. you said, our that... current law, which forces people facing a bad death to choose between suffering, suicide and Switzerland. Or Switzerland. That, yeah, that's the, yeah. the stark terrible terms choice. that people are facing, the terrible choice. You've addressed it to party leaders. Mm. Have you had a response from them? Um, actually, we've had quite good responses from them. I don't know the, uh, all, the, all the exact numbers, but I've been doing campaigning a lot mm -hmm. recently, and it is extraordinary how many people just say, you know, we've never really thought about this, we should have thought, of, we should think about it, and you are right. I think, you know, we, every single poll that asks people how they feel about this um, has an overwhelming majority in favour of the law being changed so that you don't have that stark choice of suicide or um, uh, just suffering or putting up with it. I think Switzerland is a kind of um, red herring because so few people can afford it anyway. And it's not much of a way of, to die anyway. I don't want to have to travel to Switzerland when I'm really ill on my own because you don't want to travel with your family because you will be breaking the British law then. Uh, well, Dame Pruley, thank you so much for talking to us on the UK tonight. A final thought no. to those who are watching at home. As I said, you've penned this open letter. You're collecting signatures to get this discussed in Parliament. A final thought before we go. A final thought. You know what? I feel quite hopeful about this. I think we're going to, we're going to have a new government. Um, the word is getting out that more and more MPs are coming over to our side. And I think that in the next... Parliament, we're going to have an assisted dying bill that will be humane. And in years to come, people will look back and think, why on earth didn't they do that before? Dame Pruley. Now, Sky News has been to meet a grassroots community group in Grimsby who are renovating derelict houses and giving homes to those who need them as compassionate landlords. Grimsby and Cleethorpes are our target towns. They are a new constituency at the next election, and it's just the kind of place that the Conservatives and Labour have to win to have any hope of forming the next government. But it's not an area without its problems, and campaigners say that without government help, they're taking matters into their own hands, literally. Our national correspondent, Tom Parmenter, went to meet them. It's an unlikely place to start a housing revolution. But that's what they're trying to do on Rutland Street in Grimsby. This is one of the main streets that is in East Marsh. It used to be 
called Murder Mile. If we can target this area and to build this community, yeah. then we've come a long way. With the UK in the midst of a housing crisis, Paula is on a mission. Her community group, East Marsh United, is buying up wrecks, transforming them, and then managing the homes as compassionate landlords. It started at Terry's, Terry's doing, place. Right Before his yeah, family please. moved in here, it had been left abandoned yeah, yeah. for 13 years. They just let the houses rot. So, so yeah, I mean, it's bringing them back into family homes, best thing that could happen. For the mental health, it's brilliant. You're not worrying constantly. For the children, and just, sen uh, just a sense of pride, there's somewhere you can actually be pleased to invite someone in and it just gives you a sense of comfort, pretty much. You, you can move forward. Across the street, Vicky has felt that too. She'd spent years in run-down properties where the landlords didn't seem to care. I felt very trapped. It was very, it got, I was quite depressed, to be honest with you. When I moved in here, it was like a fresh start. I realised well, I was capable of a lot more than what I was doing. Um, and I to get up and got a job, in, which I haven't done for a lot of years. When politicians are knocking on these doors, asking for votes later this year, any promises on housing will be hard to sell. OK, well, Grimsby and we're, we're at the end of the road, but actually, let's, we're going to put ourselves on the map and say, do you know what? You know, you come and have a look at what we've done because we've achieved it and we've achieved it as a community and not because this is how you've told us to do it. In a few years here, they've done more for themselves to sort out the housing policy on this street than any politician has in the past few decades. And so they crack on. Gary is overseeing the work on this East Marsh United's 10th house. I think there's about 300 houses on the East Marsh that are still empty and derelict now, what no one's living in, which we could be renovating them, getting people in them within sometimes six to eight weeks. 99% of the time with the government, if you wait for them, you'll be waiting forever. The people of East Marsh want to build their own version of the future. By taking ownership of the problems, they're following their own plan, not somebody else's. Tom Parmenter, Sky News, Grimsby. So to come on the UK tonight, we'll be talking about the world of show ponies and the new event for children involving a very different kind of horse. Plus, coming up in the sport, Tiger Woods is back on the prowl, getting ready for this week's Masters in Augusta. And at the top of the hour, we'll be inside Yemen, reporting on the country's developing humanitarian crisis. I'm also going to be speaking to Puria Zirati, the Iranian journalist stabbed in London less than a fortnight ago. The big question, who tried to kill him? That's all coming up at nine on The World with me, Yalda Hakim. US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. It's turning everybody into, you know, a crazy violent drug addict. How are you feeling? I am angry. It is an anti-woman agenda. Two women say that you paid for their abortions. Are you a hypocrite, sir? Will your candidates win? I hope so. I think they will. I think they're great candidates. I gotta be realistic. My sister's dead. More than four weeks on, there's no murder weapon and no suspect. Are you going to catch this killer? We are doing everything we can. Glenn Maxwell has pleaded not guilty to all six charges against her. Mum, how are you feeling today? 
Jeffrey said, you answer to Ghislaine, you just don't cross her. I'm so excited. Severe nightmares of these people coming in and just taking me in the middle of the night. I've watched as whole towns were torn apart by natural disaster. I'm alive and I'm thankful for that, but there are a lot of people who aren't. It's not the winds people fear most here, it's the water. We take you to the heart of the stories which shape our world. Do you truly believe what you're saying? A lot of cases that I know are reported from Ukrainian missiles themselves. Uh, ambassador, with respect, I think that's preposterous. I'm Greg Milam and I'm Sky's Chief North of England Correspondent. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. Uh, coming up shortly, we're going to be talking about um, an interesting decision from the British Show Pony Society. Uh, they are including a new event in their lineup involving a very different kind of horse. Just talking about that with Teddy during the break. <laughs> Cannot believe this is not on Sky Sports News. It's going to be an exclusive for the UK <laughs> tonight, Teddy. Please yeah. stay tuned for this. Um, but first, we are going to talk about the Masters. Not long yeah. to go until it gets underway. Uh, Tiger Woods, who we see here in his practice round. I mean, look at the crowds, just for a practice round. It look, looks beautiful, doesn't it? The, the rain we've had, but Augusta looks good. It's <laughs> going to rain on Thursday and be high wind, so we're probably used to that, so it may be interrupted. But the big news is Tiger Woods is playing. We knew that last week. And this is, you say, the practice round. is people flocking to that. And interesting, his first press conference today, which people are eagerly awaiting, he put it on his website last week, he was in bullish mood, five-time champion at Augusta, only one person's won six times, that's the legendary Jack Nicklaus. And Tiger in classic style saying that he believes he can win another one, he wouldn't be there if he's not. He's only started or completed two events since 2022, but he says, I know when that day is, when the day comes, but I still think I can. I haven't got to the point where I don't think I can. So he's very much part of this at 48 years of age. And it's only five years ago we had the coronavirus pandemic and everything in the meantime, didn't we? So it seems longer ago, but at 43 after all his injury problems, when he won it in 2019, after 11 years without a major, it captivated the sporting media over that weekend five years ago. And he, he could do it again. Maybe he's got some stuff, stiff competition. Obviously, Scotty Scheffler's the world number one there. John Rahm, defending champion, now playing on the controversial Live Tour, but he's back. So it's a huge challenge, but Tiger Woods... Yeah, very understated in lots of ways, but quietly confident still that he's only going to compete if he believes he can win and he's, he's here at Augusta potentially to get yet another green jacket. And who knows, with the magic of the Masters, anything can happen. Um, he has had plenty of injury problems. That's no secret. It's been well documented. Yeah. So what does he have to say about future plans beyond the Masters? So short term, he said at the start of this year that he hoped to play one tournament per month because of injury problems and illness, actually. He played at a, a competition, the Genesis Invitational, had to pull out halfway through with the flu earlier in the year. What happened, he had those back operations in the last decade, knee operations as well. But then if you remember three years ago in February 2021, had a really bad car crash. Mm. Thought he may not be able to walk again. He's had various joints fused. He said the big thing is just the endurance of getting around. But he does hope to play in all the majors. So it'll be the Masters uh, this time around, the US PGA Championship next month, and the US Open in June, and then Royal Tr uh, Troon, the Open Championship in July. So it'd be incredible if you're winning this country in Ayrshire, it would be quite spectacular. <laughs> but further afield as well, he's, get, he's talking about being the, uh, the Ryder Cup captain. He's in talks to be the Ryder Cup captain next year for the USA against Europe in the USA. So he's got a busy schedule ahead and hopefully he gets through the weekend first and foremost here. So that's uh, the golf coming up on Thursday live on Sky Sports. Meanwhile, in the Champions League, busy night, Arsenal and Manchester City in action. We'll tell you about that in just a second. This Sky News Sports <laughs> Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with vitality. Well, I want to know how sustainable you are, Sebastian, because uh, you're only 36. Um, yeah. You've only been out of the Formula One for a year and a bit. Are you potentially on the driver market for, for next season? Well, potentially I am because I haven't got a drive. But uh, the question is, am I looking for one? I think it depends on the, uh, you know, on the, on the package. Um, I retired from Formula One not to come back, but I also did say that you never know. So I think it still stands. Obviously, there's th things that I miss, which is mostly the competition, um, and things that I don't miss. So, um, yeah, that hasn't changed. Obviously, uh, life is very different if you're not... Uh, involved. I just want to press you a bit on the, the now or never aspect of maybe coming back because, as I say, the, the conditions 
might they not offer you a better opportunity than maybe in the next year? And are you mindful of that as, as you yeah, make for sure decision? Yeah, for sure that, you know, the thoughts cross my mind. I'm thinking about it. Uh, obviously, I retired uh, not to come back, but I retired to retire. So um, nothing in this regard has changed. But um... This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Now, we always like to leave you with something weird or wonderful on the UK tonight. And when Horse and Hounds magazine wrote a story about the launch of a hobby horse championship last week, they were forced to deny it was an April Fool. But it is, in fact, a very real event. It's been sanctioned by the British Show Pony Society. Competitors will use toy hobby horses instead of real ponies to complete a course of show jumps. Marks will be awarded for balance, energy and body control. The event will take place at the British Show Pony Summer Championships with a prize of £300 for the winner. Oh, well, let's speak now to Sharon Thomas from the British Show Pony Society. Sharon, uh, good, of us to join, uh, good of you to join us here on the UK tonight. <laughs> um, tell me about the competition. Where did this come from? Hobby horses have been around for centuries. When did it get competitive? Um, well, I think it's competitive across the world and in Australia. For us, um, we do the children's entertainment and it's the inspiration is really from watching our little ones play in a piece of grass just outside the marquee where we do the children's entertainment um, in their spare time. Um, and we thought, you know what, we could put on little competitions for them. So our chief executive, Karen Wood, looked across um, to gain on how we would run these events and we start our first qualifier within our championships this weekend. Um, we are a huge society nationwide with 20 areas. So different areas are running the competition where the top three children in each section will qualify to go towards our championships, which will be run in August. Um, so this is the first one that we're running this weekend. Yeah, some might laugh, but there's a serious element to this. And it's, you know, about getting children involved in sports, about accessibility, because horse riding is not possible for a vast majority of people who would like to take it up as a hobby, because it can be quite expensive. So this is a fun way of it being accessible to all. It is. Um, and and it, it brings the children together. If you watch them playing together, they're very inclusive and they help each other. And, and sort of even now, the interaction between the children before the competition is, you know, what, what have you called your pony? Are you going to platy turpy? Is it going to have ribbons in? What colour are the ribbons? They have what a whole backstory, right? <laughs> it's, it, they're, they're just so busy and, you know, talking to each other already. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that the children, like you said, don't just name them. They talk about their temper, temperament, what kind they of do. breed they are, which is very important from the horse, horse's point of view. They um, do. Any, any plans for this to, to go into the adult competition or is it strictly just for children? This is, we've just started. This will be our first year. It's all about the children having fun. We, we run an event to raise money to put on our children's entertainment and we also have some sponsors. Um, so this is free. The, all the children will join in free. So it's, it's just the free and it could be the start of something wonderful by the sounds of it. And for those naysayers out there, uh, it was actually proposed for inclusion at this summer's Olympics in Paris. Uh, there is, is a very serious hobby horse community out there. Um, why should you take up the hobby horse? Quick plug for, for why it's so good. Why should you? It's fun. Yeah. It's lots of fun for the children and lots of laughter and lots of involvement with us all. Brilliant. Uh, Sharon Thomas from the British Show Pony Society. Uh, good luck with the competition this summer. We'll keep an eye on its progress. Uh, that's all from the UK tonight. Coming up next is The World with Yalda Hakeem. We'll see you tomorrow night at 8. <laughs>